Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Apex Harvards. Um, so today we are going to talk about Salesforce uh, modular application development using unlocked packages. Um, my name is Mohit Shivastava, um, and let me introduce uh, Amit. Amit, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Amit Chatri. I'm a Salesforce MVP and the founder of the Apex R. I'm also an active blogger at amitsalesforce.blogspot.in and you can follow me on my Twitter handle amit underscore sfdc. So let me hand over to Mohit. Yeah, thanks Amit. Uh, so my name is Mohit Srivastava. Um, I've been working with Salesforce almost for almost eight years. Um, I'm also a Salesforce MVP and author of this book, uh, Learning Salesforce Lightning Application Development. Um, also, I work as a technical architect uh, at a company called Code Science INC. Um, so let's get started. Um, for agenda today, uh, we're going to talk about Salesforce packaging um, and then sort of differentiate between unmanaged packages, you know, managed packages, and, and then sort of get introduced to this new world of unlocked packages. Um, so the main uh, core advantage of unlocked packages is they, uh, they facilitate or help to uh, design your application in a modular way. So we're gonna look at some of the modular application development concepts, why are they needed, what are their advantages, and so on. Um, and then we're gonna go a little bit hands-on here, uh, trying to build an unlock package using Salesforce CLI. Um, so Salesforce CLI, if you have not heard, it's a command line utility uh, that provides the ability to create scratch orgs, create packages, load data, uh, you know, call any of the uh, metadata APIs, help in the deployment. So there, there are a lot of things that CLI does. And today we're going to see how we can use or leverage that to build unlocked packages. Um, and then we're going to talk about how do we actually go ahead and publish our unlocked packages and how do we install it. Um, and then um, we will talk about how can we create dependency between packages using the unlocked packages concept. And then I'll have some references and we'll have some time um, at the end of the session for uh, Q&A. So let's get started here. Uh, so packaging basically, um, you know, what it does, it sort of allows, uh, you know, us to group various Salesforce components. Now that can be applications, tabs, objects, layouts, workflows, approval processes, visual force, um, Apex, your lightning components, your web, components, profiles, permission sets, and there's a whole lot of metadata actually. So to find out the list of metadata, right? Um, there's one thing that Salesforce has been spending too much of time and effort to put, we call it as metadata coverage report. Um, so metadata coverage report um, uh, can, you know, help you to find out, you know, what are the supported metadata and whether, you know, there exists a metadata API for the same uh, can you include them in your managed packages uh, or we'll talk about what is classic packaging and managed packaging. Uh, can we include them in chain sets? Can we create unlock packages out of it? You know, can we source track them that is using scratch arts? Are there any known issues? So you can see Salesforce applications can be complex and, you know, they can involve multiple metadata um, and some of them are, you know, obviously packageable. Sometimes some of them may not be. Um, so yeah, so what packaging allows us to do is, you know, it allows to sort of, you know, bundle everything together um, for, you know, deployment and distribution. So a package can also be, you know, sort of defined as a container, you know, um, it allows for, as I said, deployment. Um, previously, you know, a Salesforce package could be created only using Salesforce uh, setup UI. So if you have logged into Salesforce, you go to packages, you know, you find your components and sort of add them and create a package. Um, but now, you know, you can also use Salesforce CLI to generate them. And we will talk about how Salesforce CLI sort of generates these packages. Um, and installation of packages is very simple. You know, when you create a package, it, it gives you an URL. Uh, so you basically, you know, 
put that URL in your browser and then you give the username and password of your Salesforce organization where you want to install it. And then there are, you know, install steps that you go through and your application is installed. That is, you know, it deploys all the components that it finds in the, in the package. Uh, traditionally, this packaging has been useful if you have been sort of developing an app exchange application because in an app exchange application you know we use something called as manage package that's i'm going to talk about that in the next slide uh, but you know the advantages of using these packages is not only just for you know app exchange application even the enterprise applications can sort of leverage uh, you know a lot of uh, goodness that these capabilities provide and, and that's why we will see why, you know, sort of unlock packages originated. Uh, you know, it was basically to support, you know, uh, enterprise applications, not just app exchange vendors or uh, ISV vendors. It's basically helps anybody building Salesforce application to sort of design their application in a modular way so that it can be easily managed. Uh, when I say easily managed, you know, you can, you can, you know, divide your application into chunks of modules and sort of focus module wise instead of sort of creating, uh, you know, a complex sort of uh, monolithic application. So we're going to talk about all those strategies of how we can modularize it. We're going to take examples, you know, some demos and, and see. And, you know, um, also, as I said, you know, for questions, feel free to sort of raise it in the in the chat section, but only during, uh, you know, after we complete the presentation, I'll pick them up and sort of start addressing them. So let's talk about, you know, um, some of you might be familiar with that, but some of you might not. So I'll, I thought I'll sort of, you know, summarize this. What is an unmanaged package? What is a managed package? And then, you know, what is this new world of unlocked packages? Right? So unmanaged packages are basically, you know, they are not upgradable. Like, you know, um, when I say not upgradable, you know, you create a package, but next time, let's say you want to sort of upgrade it, you have to sort of uninstall the previous version from, uh, from your organization and then install this newer um, version of the unmanaged package. Now, that's not helpful at all because what happens is you might install a package, an unmanaged package, and then do a lot more customizations on top of it. That is, you know, you might have installed an a custom object and now your administrator would have written some validation rules or created dependency on top of that unmanaged package. So next time when you sort of go and try to, you know, install a new uh, version of this unmanaged package, it's going to say that, no, you cannot, there already exists uh, a component with the same name. That's why Salesforce stops you from that. So it asks you that you uninstall when the administrator sort of goes and tries to uninstall it. It's going to say you've got, got to get rid of all the dependency that you have created on that unmanaged package. That is, if you have written a validation rule on top of it or use those objects in workflows and if you have created triggers on it, it's going to tell you that, you know, you please get rid of all these things, you know, and then only Salesforce will allow you to sort of install the new version of unmanaged packages. So unmanaged packages as such are not that useful. Um, only place where I find them sort of useful is, you know, if you have like a continuous integration setup and if you want to sort of only retrieve, you know, your, your components out of it. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically you retrieve components out of it and then you sort of want to deploy it using other tools like Ant or Workbench or Salesforce CLI. Then only the unmanaged packages make sense. As such, the, the URL, it's only one time. So, you know, for one-time deployment, those are fine. Uh, and the other thing is they are not IP protected. When I say they are not IP protected, that means... You know, the code inside it, like the Apex class, everything is visible, you know, to the installer. So he can go look at the logic. Um, that might work good for the open source projects, but, you know, if you want to sort of put an IP restriction on that, right? Uh, um, if you want to, you know, store or get your, uh, you don't want to expose your code base, right? Then this is not going to help. Um, the good thing about unmanaged packages, they can be created in Salesforce UI. And also, as I said, you know, one of the best advantages of unmanaged packages, if you want to analyze, okay, what are the dependency? Like, let's say you have an Apex class, right? What are the dependencies of that Apex class? So unmanaged packages are 
really great. You know, what you can do is you can create a package and you can say, yeah, I want to include this in the, uh, in the package and then it will automatically pull all the dependent things. So if there are objects referencing that Apex class, it's going to say, yeah, there are, these are the objects. So it's going to add all the objects into the, into the container. Like it's going to say, okay, the object now object depends on tab. So it's going to add the tab. So all the dependency, right? It's complete dependency is taken care of, you know, during the unmatched packages automatically by Salesforce. Um, so let's look at, an example, actually, I want to log into an org and sort of show you where you can create these packages if you have not, if you have sort of not done it before. All right. Let's log in. Just give me a sec. All right, now that we have logged in. Um, so the unmanaged packages, you know, they are great for handling the dependencies, as I said, and, you know, uh, retrieving retrieving the, you know, metadata, they are great. Like, for example, I have lots of unmanaged packages here. As I said, one of the advantages, let's say I create an unmanaged package, let's call it as like Apex hours, right, and save it. Um, and then let's say I want to add a, add something to it. Let's say I pick up something like an e-bike application, right? And then add it. So now you see it just not add the e-bike application. It's gonna add all the related related things that are required for that e-bike application. That is, you know, it added all the dependencies that this application has on that. You know, it it figured out, okay, you know, these are the uh, custom feeds that are necessary. These are the, you know, the page layouts that are necessary. These are the tabs. Um, these are the lighting pages. These are the web component bundles that are necessary. So it, it just, you know, sort of uh, put everything related to that. So now the, the advantage of, you know, having this is if you want to sort of only, you know, sort of work with this container and manage this, it becomes very easy because CLI provides a command where you can say, yeah, I want to only sort of retrieve, you know, package contents out of, uh, you know, Apex hours package name. So there are commands for that. And, you know, the, the good thing is it auto generates the package XML for you. Um, so when you retrieve by package name, you don't have to worry about, okay, what should be my package XML for all these contents? It's automatically generated. So that's the advantages of unmanaged packages. And and the other advantages is just a container. So if you want to delete and get rid of it, you just go say delete it. It doesn't delete your components from the org. It just deletes that package or the container, um, you know, uh, container. So that's the advantage. You can create as many as you want. You know, sort of this acts like you know a container. So you can create as many containers, add add elements to it, sort of retrieve it. Um, and very useful in that sense. Uh, but the moment you start saying you want to upload it and create a, a URL, then it doesn't sort of uh, work after the first time. It's good for the first time deployment, but after that you can't upgrade it. Um, so that's. That's the, uh, you know, unmanaged package for you. Very useful if you want to sort of generate a package XML of some components. Uh, really, you can create a container and then retrieve by package name. Uh, that's the advantage of it. So managed packages. So managed packages has, uh, you know, traditionally being used in App Exchange. Almost all the App Exchange applications are managed package. Uh, in fact, not almost all, all the App Exchange applications. So, the, the the thing about managed packages are they automatically get a namespace and they are upgradable. That is, you know, if I create a managed package and one org can create only one managed package uh, and an org can have only one unique namespace. So once you namespace your application and then sort of try to add things in the managed package, you know, you can upgrade them. That is, you know, you can have versions like, you know, this is let's say one first version, then you can have 1.1, 1.2, and all these becomes additive, like upgradable thing. Um, that's the advantage. And the other advantage is IP protection. Your intellectual uh, 
things that you have put in your application is protected. You know, the customers who are installing doesn't see what's, what's the code behind it. Obviously, they can view a few objects and workflows and rules, but the Apex code or, you know, uh, I guess even the visual force, the, no, the visual force you can see, but the Apex, you know, your business logic is sort of uh, hidden. You know, you cannot view it. So one of one of the disadvantages of managed packages are some of the components are locked. Meaning, you know, if if you have already worked with managed packages, you have already absorbed it. Like the moment you create a managed package, some of the things in them gets locked. Like for example, you know, you decide to sort of make a field, um, let's say, you know, unique, and then you know you created a package version one. And in package version two, you want to sort of, you know, get rid of that custom field and you want to sort of, uh, you know, make it not unique. That's not possible because some elements actually get locked, you know, when, when a managed package is generated. Now, the reason why they lock it is because, you know, it, it facilitates the, uh, you know, upgradability. So that's that's the disadvantage of it, right? You cannot go back to something else. You know, you have to always sort of, you know, keep depreciating it. And you know, depreciating doesn't mean that you are getting rid of those components uh, from the package. Uh, the other advantage of managed packages, it sort of also uh, helps in extension. Like for example, if you want to sort of define your application in a modular way, you can create a base package and then keep extending it. You know, so today it allows you to sort of extend these, uh, you know, managed packages. Now the extension package can again be an unmanaged or it can be a managed code itself. Um, so that that's other advantages of managed packages. Um, so unlocked packages were primarily designed for two purposes. One purpose was basically, you know, they like the concept of managed packages, but they were sort of locked, right? So they wanted to unlock few elements in them, right? They wanted to unlock, meaning, you know, let's say uh, you want to create, you have created a package with some custom objects and fields, uh, and you want to delete a field in the next version of the package. So unlock packages allows you to do that, while the managed packages doesn't allow you to do that. So uh, in unlock packages, they wanted to make it available for both ISV vendors and, as I said, enterprise applications. Um, and an admin can easily go and modify content. So, you know, let's say you've created an Apex class, this unlock package is installed in your production, so admin can go override it. You know. Um, uh, while in managed packages, obviously you cannot do that. And unlock packages are upgradable, just like managed packages. So it's almost like managed packages, but some of the you know capabilities that managed package provides, or some of the disadvantages like locking, etc., is not there here. And the other advantage of unlock packages are they are not only just meant for ISVs. They are, as I said, it's meant for your system integrators and also your enterprise customers. Um, so one of the one of the drawback of unlock packages at this point is you don't you, you cannot generate an unlock packages today um, directly from Salesforce UI just like managed packages and unmanaged packages you need Salesforce CLI to sort of allow a generation of these and also as I said one of the biggest advantages of these unlock packages are it sort of allows you to build your application in a modular way meaning you know you can divide your um, package your entire code base into multiple, uh, you know, independent entities first, and then sort of create dependencies between them. So it's sort of module, you know, module approach where you know that, okay, these are the modules in our application. So it makes it easier for both development purposes, debugging, testing, um, and managing the entire application lifecycle development. Um, also the unlock, Unlocked packages are easier, uh, you know, to sort of, uh, uh, you know, manage both for, you know, testing and also for the development. So we're going to see and try building an unlock packages today. Um, so let before before we sort of begin into hands on and try to do a few of the stuff here. Um, 
I want to sort of take some time on what is modular application development, right? Um, so today, if you look at your arc, some of your arcs, you might have like, you know, thousands or 10,000s or maybe 20,000s of components sitting all bundled without knowing what is, what is dependent on, on what, you know, it's hard to trace down the dependency. So, um, so we call it as like a happy soup where you have like tons of components sitting, there's no dependency. So moment, let's say you want to sort of modify some metadata or you want to retrieve Apex class today, the way you retrieve in your IDE is, you know, you say, yeah, get me all the classes. Now there might be like two hundreds of classes and you know, your IDE gets slow. You know, you're trying to retrieve everything at, at a same time. Um, it becomes hard, right? Like, now imagine if everything was broken into smaller chunks and you were managing only that aspect of it, right? It, it makes it very simpler. Um, so that's that's what the idea of un unlock packages. As you can see, a happy soup which has tons of components is sort of organized further and broken into uh, different smaller chunks here, right? Um, so that's what unlock packages is for. That is, you don't treat your application as one gigantic monolithic application. You treat it as different modules. So what what do I mean by modules? Is let's say you know you have an application. Um, let's say you have an application which uh, which basically is like let's imagine that you have um, application with let's say ten different custom objects. Maybe you know let's say hundreds of Apex classes. Now, all the hundred of hundred Apex classes might not, you know, all those hundred might not be part of one functionality, right? It might be uh, uh, needed for one specific functionality. And let's say you break down further, right? If you can segregate into independent Apex classes, let's say in, in hundred, let's say, 20 of your Apex classes doesn't depend on anything. They are just purely util classes. So you might want to put them in a separate module, you know, so that it's very easy to manage them. And then you have like, let's say, you know, another 20 or 30 Apex classes, which are very specific to a particular functionality. So that requires, let's say, you know, five objects out of those 10 objects. So you can group those five objects and 50 Apex classes into one module, right? So you start basically, the idea is you start basically breaking your application into multiple modules independent of each other. And then if there is a dependency of one over the other, you configure that dependency on top of it, right? So that's the idea of unlock packages. So we're gonna try building an unlock package now and uh, see how we can uh, sort of build an unlock packages. Um, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, I'll come back to the slides, but uh, let's get started. So to start, I'll, I'll actually start with Salesforce CLI because the reason why I want to start with Salesforce CLI is because unlock packages, as I said today, can be created only using Salesforce CLI. You know, you don't have any UI. And, and the other thing is, so there are some prerequisites for the unlock packages. Now, Let's look at what are the prerequisites for them. So the first prerequisite is you need to have something called as dev hub for your organization. Um, without that dev hub, you won't be able to create unlock packages. Now the dev hub is enabled in all the developer orgs today, uh, all the production orgs, um, and almost every org has this developer hub. You know your product, so it's you won't find it in your sandbox, but you know it will be in your production org. So. So the first criteria for unlock packages is you have to enable them. Um, and as you can see here, uh, you know, they are GA. So GA means they are generally available. That is, you know, if you run into any bug or issue with it, Salesforce is ready to support it. So um, that's what the unlock pack, uh, the GA means. So, so the first criteria, as I said, you need to have like dev hub. And the second thing is you need to be well versed with the CLI. Salesforce CLI because some of these are not available through the Visual Studio Code extension pack that Salesforce have, has for uh, Salesforce. So you need to be well versed and knowing some of the commands. Um, so one quick thing is, you know, is in SF. So the mo you have to install the CLI from the you know CLI website and install Salesforce DX plugin. 
So the moment you have that, you can do something like SFDX help, and that's going to list all the all the commands. So you can you can pretty much the documentation is embedded inside the CLI itself. So let's say I want to explore force um, package commands, right? SFDX force package commands. So force package commands has all the you know packaging related uh, capabilities. As you can see. Uh, these are some of the commands that are available. That is, you can create a package, you can install it, you can list all the installed packages in your organization. Um, you can version create. We'll talk about what is version, what is package, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera here as we go go. So first, um, sorry. So first, let us uh, let us scaffold a project. Scaffold a Salesforce uh, project. Um, to scaffold a Salesforce project, um, you know you can you can navigate to wherever you want. And uh, to scaffold the project, uh, let's see if this is actually all right. So to scaffold a project, force project command is what helps us to scaffold a project. So if you go to uh, force project command it has two commands one is to create a package and the other one is to sort of upgrade it um, now as you can see you know i'm not sort of remembering all these commands i'm just helping on this and then sort of trying to see what these commands mean you know so you can basically help on every command and see what these commands actually do there will be samples there will be uh, definitions for each of these flags what they do so okay so let's create a project um let's call it as like do you want to call it as maybe apex hours should we call it as apex hours so let's create a project so i'm gonna create a project here i'm gonna say apex hours so this is how you scaffold a project now you can do this through the visual studio extension pack or through the cli you know so i'm using the cli because it gives me more flexibility and control i'm gonna say sfdx project for first project create project name apex hours right so i say enter and what this will do is it's gonna create uh, the scaffold for me so what i mean by scaffold is i'm gonna cd into the apex hours i'm gonna do so code slash dart just opens this project folder in visual studio code editor um, so as you can see, it scaffolded me a few things, you know. Um, so what it did is it sort of said, okay, I have a main folder called Force App. It has this is the SFDX structure of the project, um, and then it also gave me a SFDX project JSON file, right? So this JSON file is very useful. We'll talk about that. Um, we'll talk about what this package directory means and so so on. One thing that you saw, it there is also a config folder where you can specify a few things like what arc preferences you want, features and settings. So I don't want to talk about it in detail, but features are like, you know, they are additional features or licenses that you require. While settings are like, you know, if you want to enable a few things, like if you want to enable chatter in your scratch arcs, you can all define it. So this is basically the definition of your scratch art so you can create scratch offs now so the other thing i want to say is for unlock packages um some of you might think that you need scratch arcs um for this but the, the reality is you don't need scratch arcs. you can do it in you know you can do it with uh without scratch arcs as well you know with your developer edition arcs because um the unlock packages they get generated out of the source directly and not from the um, not from from the arc, you know. If you have like a dev hub that is linked, uh, you can generate directly out of that. So, so yeah, you don't need scratch arcs, but scratch arcs are recommended because you know they allow for faster deployments. And the other benefits of scratch arcs is you know you can you can dispose them at will, and you can create directly everything from source. So um, they are recommended, but might not be you know needed everything can be managed through the cli and the source code here and you, know, you don't need scratch but they are good for you know just pushing the code and sort of testing it so 
Um, let's do this. So the first, the other thing that we want to do is sort of authorize a dev hub because as I said, everything works like unlock package generation sort of depends on the dev hub. You know, if you don't have a dev hub link to your project, um, it's not much, uh, you can, you cannot create these unlock packages. So let's, let's link my dev hub. So <clears throat> SFDX actually, um, so the moment you have SFDX project, you should start seeing some of these commands called SFDX. So let's actually authorize this dev hub. So I'm gonna say authorize the dev hub. What it's gonna do is gonna start, it's gonna open a browser for me where I can key in my credentials of the dev hub org. So let's go here and yeah, so I keyed in my credentials. Now DevHub, as I said, it can be enabled on your developer org. So today if you sign up for a developer org, it will have the DevHub enabled. Uh, so the moment it's done, it says, yeah, it successfully authorized it. You may close the browser. It sort of authorized this thing. Um, so it authorized the DevHub, right? Um, now how do I make sure that, or how do I see that, right? So one thing I'm gonna do here, uh, this is this is confusing. Okay, I'm gonna put it here. Okay, so let's do this. So I'm gonna cd into the Apex hours, right? This is my project directory. So now I can do something like sfdx for config list. So what this will do is this is gonna show us whether we have a so as you can see, we do have a default dev hub username set for this. You know, it says it's local. So that's, I also have a default username for an org that I have linked. Now I'm gonna unlink that and sort of link a different scratch org. So as you can see, it has default dev hub username. I've linked all these things. Um, so the dev hub is authorized now. So this project actually now knows that locally it has to only look at to this dev hub that is by this org. So now once we have authorized to the dev hub, we should be able to create scratch orgs out of it, push our code. So before we do that, I'm gonna copy paste a code. Um, so let's do this actually. So I'm gonna copy paste an application here called recruiting app, where is it? Copy this folder. I'm gonna copy it into the Apex Hours folder, basically. Now, the reason why I'm doing is I don't want to spend time um, building an application, right? Um, I'm assuming that an application is already built and uh, the name of the application is Recruiting App. Let me show you here in the, so let's refresh it. So the Recruiting App folder. So this is how you organize your modules in, in the unlock packages world. That is what you do is you, every package that you create, you can give a name and that will have main default structure. And then, you know, you can put all your metadata components in it. So let's say I have an Apex class, I have some lighting pages, I have some. Um, so this app has just two objects, job application and position. Um, and then it has like, a simple page, it has a permission set, it has some profiles, it has tabs, nothing nothing special. I just wanted to sort of have this so that we can watch, you know, creating unlock packages and how we create dependencies between this and the other package, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm gonna, so to make sure that this comp compiles, I'm gonna create a, a scratch org and sort of push this actually. So before we push it, we will have to do a few things here. Um, one thing, the first thing we'll have to say is, okay, so SFDX project.json, right? This is where the unlock packages, you know, this is where the configuration of these unlock packages or dependencies is configured, right? So we're gonna look at this JSON in, in depth, but for time being, let's say that, okay, our path for this application is this one. Let me say, rename this. So let's say recruiting application. All right, so I said, okay, my default for this is recruiting app and here's the thing. Okay, so what's what's my next step? So my next step is basically, I'm gonna try uh, creating a scratch art 
and sort of pushing this to a scratch org so that I can I can be sure that okay whatever code base that I have compiles and sort of looks good for the you know for the deployment purposes. Now how did I build this? It's basically by creating a scratch org, creating all those objects, using force source pull to retrieve all those metadata. That's how I built this package. Um, so let's uh, let's actually try to create a scratch org. So to create a scratch org, again, we can use CLI to do it actually. Um, so again, um, I don't remember the command, so I'm gonna say, I know that it is a part of the force or create command, so I'm gonna help on that. So force or create, this is how you create a scratch org. Um, as I said, it's not needed. The scratch orgs are not needed. You know, you can authorize this with any other dev org and sort of build this, you know, uh, but for for easier purposes, since I already have, um, you know, pre-compiled, I just want to sort of create a scratch org and sort of deploy it. So I think this command, right, is what I'm gonna run. So let me take a, sort of a notepad because I have to modify a few things here. File, new file. So this is the definition of the JSON, right? So I'm gonna say my scratch org, right? And then, so this, in, in my case, the config file is, uh, where is my config file? So this is the one, it's called project scratch definition. So I'm gonna just copy paste the file name here, sort of put it here. Uh, okay, I'm making a typo here, alias. And also I can say set default username. So what this would do is it's gonna, you can watch it here, where, where was my command line? So as you can see, set default username, well, what it will do is it's gonna say, yeah, this is your default username. That will that means any operation will look at to this scratch org by default. So I think I missed a few things here. Okay, I think I'm correct. Okay, let's create a scratch org here. Um, so dev hub, the, the scratch orgs can be created using the command line. You can also type, so one more thing, you can also type it in this terminal as well that uh, Visual Studio Code code provides, but I prefer my terminal. Um, so I'm gonna say, yeah, create me a scratch org. Let's see what happens here. So it's gonna create the scratch org now. It should take a few seconds to sort of create it. Uh, but the idea is I'm gonna create the scratch org and then I'm gonna push all the, you know, all the command or, or all the, the metadata in this recruiting app to that scratch org. And the reason why I'm doing that, so now as you can see, the scratch org is sort of created. Now the reason why I'm doing that is again, I'm, I just want to make sure that this folder, recruiting app, has all the metadata and its dependency that is com, com, can be compiled, you know? Uh, there's no surprise to me when I sort of start creating a package out of it that, you know, there's something wrong in this, right? Um, that's the, the aim of this. Uh, so let's do this. So, okay. So what I did here is I said this. So let's open this scratch org before that. I want to open the scratch org. So how do you do that? So you can do it wider. So one more thing is I built my own extension called DX Code Companion that has some more utilities. It allows you to save your Apex classes, you know, faster um, just by Control S or Command S in uh, in Mac, um, and also it has some some more capabilities. You know, you can download that extension also from the VS Code Marketplace. But one of the commands that I have is to open the. When I click on this, it directly opens the Scratch or default Scratch or. So, as you can see, it opens the default Scratch or for me. So this is the default Scratch or um, that I've set. Now, what I'm, my next step is basically to sort of push all the code from this recruiting app. And that's why I said, okay, my path here for the package directory is recruiting app by default. That's the default true. Um, so you can push it by using SFTX for source push. That's the command actually. You can also do a help on that if you want. You can do this first source push help, right? 
So if you do a help for that, it's gonna say, okay, these are the things. So it's very simple. All that you need, I need here is that I need to say force source push. So this should start pushing everything that's there here to the scratch org, right? We can watch that now. Let's go to Salesforce Classic a bit here so that I can go to that deployment status window and see if anything is getting deployed to this. So yeah, as you can see, the deployment is in progress. Uh, it's deploying a few things. Oh, there is an error here. Let's see what's the error here. No Apex class name, da, 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 da. Okay, looks like I've broken the dependency. So that's gonna throw me an error, right? So it says there was push error, um, no Apex class name create job found. Let's see why, why was that happened? So maybe my profile has something, some class that I don't have. So let's fix that first. So that's what was the job name, create job. So let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of this class actually. I might have mistakenly created it and sort of created the dependency. Uh, I wanna make sure that I'm doing the right manipulations of the files here. Is it also referenced here? No, it's also referenced here, no. I wanna make sure that this reference is not there in any place. Okay, fine. I'm gonna attempt one more time, source source push. So as you can see, you know, Always pushing up to a scratch org helps you to find out, you know, whether your packet or whether your contents that you have is a source that has everything, you know. So let's say the conflict found in this. So I'm gonna say SFTX force source push, and you can override with F flag here. So it just overrides the conflict. I don't want to deal with the conflict unexpected argument push because I made errors. That's what happens. Okay, now this must start pushing everything up. And it should be successful this time. Okay, all right, so everything was successful now. Um, we can see that, that you know, it got succeeded. Now if you go look at the objects in the scratch arts, you should see there are two objects and you know, all other things so this was the step in creating the um the scratch org and the reason I, again i want to stress this the reason why i did is i wanted to make sure my code compiles um, and that's one way of doing it by creating a scratch org and pushing it um, so now let's get to the the real um thing right so the real thing or the real aim of of this was to create an unlocked package out of this this whole entity. So how do we do that actually? So I wanna go back to the presentation here. Um, so you can create a package by using this package command. We talked about <clears throat> this earlier. So I'm gonna just, so the, let's look at this command. So this command, you know, you can create a package today by using force package create. So the package type you specify it as unlocked. The path is from where the gets created. In our case, the path is the recruiting app, right? That's the path. So I'm gonna substitute with that. Um, if you don't, so unlock packages, you can also assign a namespace, but you know, you're all, you also have the option to say, no, I don't want to assign it. And the target dev hub username, if you put something here, it is gonna override with other dev hub if you have. But in our case, we have a default dev hub. Right, so I don't need this actually because that's set as the default. Um, so the name of the package, let's give it as like Apex Hour RC. Let's put it this way. Let's put a description. This is a demo unlocked package, right? Okay. Perfect. So SFDX force package create team Apex hours descriptions path. Now let's uh, let's try to execute this actually. So executing this should 
um, create a package for us. And you will see this is very instantaneous actually. So the moment I type it, let's see, it should be, it should be faster. So as you can see, it said it created a package, okay? And also it created a, you know, it assigns a package ID to it. So let's look at, so one thing you absorbed in this, so we didn't have this version name, version number, we did not have even the package name here, and we didn't have the package alias. So the first thing that got changed automatically in our SFDX product.json is all these elements got added, and the package alias is the package name, and it, it assigns a ID here. Now at this point, you might be thinking that we are done because you know this is the unlock package but th but this is not the unlock packages this is the package you know and it is the container actually the top element and you generate versions out of it that's the true package actually so let's generate that version you know uh, so this is just the id or the parent id to designate so for example if i say sfdx for package list, it's gonna list me all the all the unlocked packages actually that are cr created in in this dev hub. So let's see how many of them. So as you can see, I've already created few things just for my purposes, and this is the new one that we created, right? Um, so I think what you can we can also do is explore for package. And then say, and let's do a help on this to see what commands we have. So we do also have version lists. So let's list the versions of, let's do a help on this to find out what we have here. So yeah, so the way you can actually list your versions is by, right, so you can say, you can put the hatch ID, which is the zero hatch ID, and it will list all the package versions for that. So for our package, our command will be, so this hatch ID should be our hatch ID, and we know our hatch ID by this. So this is our zero hatch ID or the parent ID. So let's look at if we have a package versions. Let's go look at here. It should say, no, you don't have a package version, right? Because there is nothing. I mean, we did not create a package version. So it says no results found, right? So let's create a package version. So to create a package version, let's go back to our slides. So this is the command actually. So I have added everything in the in the presentation so that it's easier for you guys to refer it later. Um, and this is, honestly, this is a little complex topic, you know, uh, because it involves CLI commands and et cetera. So we need the package name, right? So we know our package name that we had, what did we say, apex our RC, okay. And we know which directory it should actually create the package version, right? So which directory is this? Or is it this one, recruiting app, right? This recruiting app, so let's say. And then we should say, so this, parameter you don't need it because we have made default actually we have the uh, if if you did not make it default it will ask you for the alias but you don't need it because we have said it's default the other thing we need is this now the reason why we need this x is because we are saying don't protect by any key now if you want to give a key you can say key and put the key value here that means whoever is installing this package they will need the key actually so you're protecting by key for us we are since it's all demo we're gonna say no key so let's generate a package version for this so let's do this so watch the json here so we have this json right we only have zero hatch id we had a path so let's do this thing actually so so let's generate the version. So what does this 10 means is it's gonna wait for 10 minutes to generate the package, you know. My CLI is gonna pull for 10 continuous minutes, you know. Um, if the package actually gets generated, it's gonna stop. But after that 10 minutes, you know, it's gonna die off, meaning you will have to use some other commands to sort of track it, you know. So let's, uh, let's generate this actually. So this is gonna take some time. Um, 
because it's actually generating the package. So it's going to take maybe like, I would say like two, three minutes. So till that, we don't want to be watching my screen, right? Um, we're going to be continuing with the presentation. And then we will, once it's generated, I'll show you what, what it means. So, so let's, uh, let's see what we did. So we created unlock packages, right? Directly from, um, yeah directly from the CLI, we saw there was no Salesforce UI to do it. Also, we saw scratch orgs are not mandatory, but I was using scratch orgs, but you know, our dev hub is mandatory. However, you know, you can, um, uh, you can also do it if you connect your CLI with the dev org and sort of, uh, the only thing if you are working with like non scratch org is you want to keep the source in DX source format, right? Um, and to do that, you'll have to do some conversions, you know, if you're going that way. Um, that's why I have a plugin, like the, the uh, that's why I have this plugin that I've created that's gonna help you actually. So if you go to CCDX, one of the things that I give you is retrieve DX source from package. So what that, ha that does is for example, if you do a retrieve DX source, it's gonna tell you, okay, which it's gonna tell you which package you want to pull the source code from and then, you know, Maybe I can, maybe I can show you actually in one of the projects. Let me show you. Let me go to something that I can show you. Let's see if this works still. This might not actually, I might not, or this works. Yeah, this, this should work actually. So one of the things that I have is, Let's get rid of this folder. So one of the things I have in this DX code companion plugin is to automatically retrieve contents from the package by, um, you know, by, uh, what do you call, by, D, uh, by the package name and then change it into DX source. So you can say retrieve DX source from package. So it's gonna give you all the packages in your org. So this project folder is connected to an org where I have all these packages. Now I can, you know, I can retrieve the contents by just clicking on that and it's gonna create my custom created command here and it will retrieve all the, so it's gonna retrieve all the metadata from the package and then do the source conversion and have it converted into the DX format. And it's gonna also put the package XML in the manifest folder um, and also put all the, all the elements actually. So as you can see, it, it, it retrieve is completed from the package. Now it's converting to DX source format. And then, you know, it, it, it basically puts it in the force app directory. So as you can see, I have package XML and everything in the DX source format, right? Um, so that's one way of sort of, uh, you know, creating these are working out a package directly as a, you know, from the non DX or format arcs by using this plugin. Um, so let's, uh, let's go back to our project Apex hours. Uh, okay. All right. So now we have this package generated and, uh, the package is generated. We see there is something, so we got the package URL and also we see there is this zero four D ID actually. So let's go to zero four D ID here. Um, so now you can see there are a few more things that got added in this project.json. Uh, one of the things that got added is this 40 ID for this zero uh, 40 ID for this package version. So um, that's the one thing that got added, right? So now what happened is now we have the package link to sort of install it. And this is an unlock packages. It's just going to look like any other package and you can install this in any environment that you like. Um, that's, that's how you generate the, um, unlock packages, but, um, we're gonna, so this is not just the advantage of the unlock packages, right? <clears throat> we talked about modular code practices that is breaking it into multiple modules. Now, the next thing that I have is how do I sort of, um, breaking this into, um, you know, how do I create dependency, right? So. So we'll come back to this one, but before that, let's come back to this slide, which is how do we create dependencies between the package? Um, so, so this 
one that I had, right? Um, this thing that I had. Okay, this thing all makes sense. Um, but now what happens if I have another, uh, you know, if I want to sort of build on top of this package, right? Like, let's imagine this is the base package for uh, for my other package or other package that I am I'm creating, you know, my goal here is to break them into multiple packages um, and sort of keep it independent and then configure the dependency between them. And and the reason why I want to sort of do that is because I can keep everything modular that is in in its own directory and so that you know next time I know that okay I have to modify an object or make field addition then I'll come and make the field additions and then sort of retrieve it only in this directory and not worry about other code base that's there in the uh, in my org. Or alternatively for other developers, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about any other things in this package. They can only take this source code, sort of deploy it into Scratch or work it, retrieve it, and sort of modify that content and sort of, you know, submit a pull request and merge against this, right? Um, so let's see how we can create dependencies. So creating dependencies is very, um, simple, all that it requires is if you look at my screen here, um, to create dependencies. So in this case, this is an example where I have a package A and then I have package B. And as you can see, package A actually depends, sorry, package B actually depends on package A. So the way we do that is by doing something called as dependencies and we specify dependencies and you specify the package and the version name. So one thing you will observe in the version name, we say 3.3.0.latest. So latest is what we use so that we know that this package V depends on package's latest version, okay? So let's do this actually. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a folder here called, let's say classes, okay? classes folder and what I'm gonna do is use one of the objects I'm gonna say I want to create an apex class let's call it as like job application util right let's say job application util So I created this. Now I want to sort of make sure that I create a dependencies on the other package, right? And I can do that by referencing the object. So I'm gonna say, like, I'm just gonna create a method here. Like void, da, 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 da. So there's a, uh, let's say I just want to say like get positions or something. I just want to create a dependency for this object. Let me go back to let me go back to my arg. Sorry, let's go back to my arg. So I'm gonna go to the objects. Sorry, this is not the one. This is not the one. This is the one. So I'm just gonna create a dependency on this. Okay. So to create a dependency. Okay. So I'm gonna straight away just reference this object actually. Job equals new job application. Sorry. Job application. Yeah, just return this, right? I'm just gonna say return job. Maybe I have to say instead of void this guy. Okay, so the reason why I created this class is because, you know, I want to show you that this particular folder, it doesn't have this job application object. It is in this recruiting app, app, which is another module. Let's imagine it's another module. And, you know, this module assumes that, you know, somebody is actually sort of installed this recruiting app and then building on top of it. Okay, so I'm going to save this. So as you can see, I just did control S. Uh, because I have this DX code companion, it's just gonna, you know, simply push this to the scratch org and the class gets created very rapidly. In fact, if you modify, you will see that, you know, let's say I, I put an error here and try to sort of save this, you know, you will see that it also throws me a better error. Um, does the plugin does a better job. So as you can see, it says, yeah, these are the errors, you can fix it. So yeah, this DX code plugin, um, 
you know, is available in the VS Studio Code Marketplace. And all that you need is sort of install this uh, extension and also run SFDX. Uh, there's a, there are a few prerequisites. So once you do that, you have this DX Code companion. The real power of that is, you know, if you're saving Epix class or other code files, you just do Control S today and it makes it faster safe compared to what Salesforce uh, provides in its uh, its own extension. So it sort of took some time to actually build that. So feel free to sort of use it and you know let me know the feedback or if you run into any bugs, let, let us know. Um, so I've created, so our next step is I've created this dependency, right? So now how do I denote that dependency in the project.json that, hey, you know, we are creating another package, right? And um that has a dependency on the other so let's see actually so to help you that i'm going to copy paste a few things straight away because i don't want to sort of uh waste my time sort of understanding this but i'm going to explain you how i sort of doing it so this is just an example that i was working yesterday so so first thing first what we will do is we will say that we need one more node here for the second package, right? So I'm gonna say, yeah, we need one more node here for the second package. And the path of that will be ports app. Ports app, okay? And that might be our default going forward. So I can say that is our default. I can change this to say this is not our default anymore. Um, and also I'm gonna assign it as a package name, let's say, Let's maybe give this as package name as let's say, you know, let's say Apex Hour DC, DP. DP means dependency. I'm just giving a, any name. Let's also give it a version number. Otherwise, this is going to complain. Now it's not complaining anymore. And we also need to sort of give an alias. So this is an alias for the package, right? So, um, so we, we would need to sort of um give an alias here but we don't know the hid because we have not generated it one right so let's generate one um so the so let's create let's create another package here so let's go back to the package command that we ran and this time we'll run it with a different thing so to create a package as i said how do we create a package is this guy let's copy this thing Let's copy this file new. So Apex Hour, what did we name it as? DP description. This is a dependent package or a second package. This is a second package dependent on first base package. Dependent on first base package, right? This is also of type unlock. In this case, our path is for SAP, right? And we also don't want namespace for this, right? Uh, where's it? Delete it. Oh, this is. Hold on. What's going on here? Okay, so let's um, let's type this so that it generates second package for me. Let's do this. Uh, enter. Let's see what happens. So it should quickly give us that container, right? Um, it should give us that cannot convert undefined or null to an object. Ooh, 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 why is this happening? Let's see. What have we messed up here? Have we messed up anything here? It says cannot convert undefined or null to an object. Okay, let's uh, let's see. There must be something going wrong. So something that we have said is undefined. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. So because you know I sort of named the package directly. Let's. I guess I don't need to do this. So let's let's get rid of this one. You know, it says undefined because. Let's let's do this actually. Fingers crossed. Let's see if it works.
package name must be unique for the namespace. Okay, that makes sense now. The package name must be unique for the namespace. Uh, let's change the package name to something else actually. I might have created uh, created a different package or something. Let's uh, let's name it something. Let's call it as DB package. Okay, let's do this. Okay, good. So it got generated. It looks like you know something was wrong going on. Anyway, so um, the package ID got generated, right? Um, so we can now define that. So it automatically added, right? So as you can see, the DP package got added. The version number was automatically appended. Now one of the things that happened as a part of this was, you know, it also assigned the zero H ID, which is the the package ID, right? So now let's create a dependency. To create a dependency, we will need, you know, something like this. We'll need to say, okay, what is it dependent on? So we're gonna say, what is it dependent on? So it's dependent on which package? So it is dependent on this fix our RC package, which obviously on the latest, that's what it's dependent on. And this also is referred here, right? Um, so that should be it to actually create a dependency package. Now let's actually try to generate a version, right? So, sorry, um, let's generate a version here. You guys can see my screen still? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's actually create a, a you know, package version because package uh, by itself has no meaning, right? So how did we create a previous package version, right? Let's see, so let's go back to the slides actually. And as you can see, I'm doing everything in real time. So the chances of me doing something wrong is very, very high, um, but I, I appreciate the patience here uh, to sort of stay with me and sort of figure this stuff out. So the other thing is, yeah, the version, right? So we need the package name, we know our package name in this case is, where is the package name? We said DP package, right? Where is that? Okay, so this is fine. As I said, we don't need it because it's by default. And also we need this underscore underscore X, okay? So the reason why I need this, I think it's just, the reason why I need this, as I said, it's because I don't want to protect it by key. If you want, you can say key and put the key. So now I'm gonna say, let's create a package version, right? So so let's start that process. And as I told, it's gonna be a long process. It's gonna take some time. I wanna make sure that it gets kicked off and then we can come back to the slides, discuss it, and then, okay, so it's started. Um, so let's talk about what you know just to summarize what we are trying to do right um so we are trying to create and so we created an application called recruiting app we created unlocked packages out of it which had all these contents that you saw you know all the metadata that you saw it had an application it had few classes you know in fact one class it had object it had pages permission set stamps that's my first package the second package that i'm trying to say is okay i'm trying to say that the first package is the base for the second package so the second package basically is a base and in second package i don't have anything you know i just have one simple class now in a real world scenario your first package might be as i said when i was starting my talk like it can be like 50 different you know independent classes and let's say your second package is like 10 to 20 classes and it depends on you know few of those 50 classes or objects in the first package, right? So I'm trying to sort of establish a dependency. So that way you can sort of establish dependency between multiple unlock packages. In fact, you can also establish a dependency between a managed package and an unlock packages or a managed extension package and an unlock package. So things like that. So you can basically divide everything into modules like this. You can have multiple folders like this, taken into smaller, smaller chunks and then have dependencies configured for every 
package. Now the dependency might not be just one dependency. This is one dependency. Sometimes it might be like, okay, one of the packet depends on like three, four more packages, right? So this is still in progress once it completes. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna actually go through the slides real quick and then um, go through a few more things. And then, you know, we will, by that time we'll have the package and then I, I can install that somewhere and show you how the installation happens, etc. So one thing you got to remember is all these packages that we are generating is a beta package. By default, a beta package is generated. It's not released. Uh, so you can release by a command called promote command where you just say the package name and the at one dot whatever is this. This is the exact version that you want to promote it or call it as released, right? So once you promote a package using this command, what happens is it becomes a released package, meaning you know you can install that in production environment. So the current package that I have is beta. It cannot be installed in like true production orgs. You know you can install it in dev orgs, etc. But in true production orgs, those will not be installed. So this is still actually spinning up. Um, so that's how you promote it. You know. Um, you basically say package name and package version and which dev hub you want to associate it. Um, installation of the package, as I said, you can we can do it through the through the command line as well. If you put the package name and the version, um, and then put the alias for the org, it will do it. Otherwise, you can just take the URL that gets generated and install it. Okay. Um, so that's something that I wanted to cover in this. And then let's look at some complex. So I have some references here. There are some trailhead modules. Um, I think they do a good job in explaining all this. There's a four part block series from Salesforce that does all these things. Um, there's an app development guide which sort of talks about all these things. Um, one of the things that I forgot here is an application called Easy Spaces from Salesforce. Um, so there's a trailhead app called Easy Spaces. So this actually shows you the same concept you know, so you can see they created a base code here and then they have object and then they have styles and then they have this application actually depend on all these things. Um, and how do they configure them? It's in the SFDC project or in the project.json, you can see that, you know, they have like a base object package, which is completely independent. They have a base code, which depends on the base object. Then they have a base style, which depends on the base object and the base code. And then they have finally this easy management application folder, which depends on base objects, base code, and base styles, All right? So that's how they've created this dependencies. Um, so as I said, the advantage of doing all these things is you keep everything in its own folder. And uh, you know every folder, it becomes very easy to manage and looking at. So if you look at this main folder, right? It has only like, how many classes? Like maybe this is the base, class right so all the base classes are here like services which are generic right um, and then if you look at their base object it might not have any class it might have just objects here and then you know base style might have only like aura components and other things right no classes anything like that and the easy management app finally will have a bunch of other metadata, right? So what it means is for someone, let's say you want to modify an object, like if you are working in an agile and you want to say, okay, this story is just creating this object, somebody might have to just come into this, sort of push this code to the scratch org and only modify the object and sort of submit a PR or, uh, you know, against this object folder instead of sort of worrying about any other thing in the application, right? It makes it very focused. You become very focused on specific things of an application than sort of imagining your application as like all one monolithic layer. Let's see if our, okay. So our installation URL is generated. So let's actually try to install this in one of, I'm gonna try install this in one of the dev orgs and I'll show you what happens actually if I try to install it. So remember this package has only one, this class, which was that this job application util class. So technically what should happen is this should not even get installed, right? I'm gonna try installing this actually, let's see. Maybe I install this here. Damn it, okay. That's, uh, 
Let me put a better, better org where I can install. I'm finding an org actually. What do you, I mean, what do you guys think that will happen? So what will happen is this is gonna fail. The reason for the failure is it's gonna say, hey, you know, you know what, this DDP, whatever dependent package that you have is actually dependent on, you know, one of the packages. So first install that and then install this. So, uh, so the package you're trying to install depends on the package Apex hours RC version 0.1, right? So you install that before you install that. So while if I try to sort of install that previous version, where was it? Okay, watch the version. So <clears throat> you can easily, so now I'm lost, right? Like where do I find that previous package that I got generated? Oh, it's here. But you can also find it by, you know, by the previous command that I was showing you, which was first package version list, right? Now this is gonna list all the versions for a package with a package ID, right? So as you can see, this has this 40 ID. So this 40 ID is all that you need actually to install it. Right. So your package URL at the end has this P0 and then has this 40 ID. Right. So let me go back to the previous one. I think this was. Let me try installing this one. This is the like the base package that we built. So this should go fine because it will say it doesn't have any dependency, right? So this should go fine. Is there something wrong in it? should be fine you can view the components for it so these are the components that we added to it all right so this is gonna gonna take some time to install maybe like a minute or so but yeah definitely this will get installed and then you know we have the second package we can install that on top of it um, to work, let's say somebody wants to work with all of this, right? They can simply clone the folder from the Git repository and do a Git, uh, Git clone of this and then say SFDX for source push. It's gonna push everything to scratch org so that they can actually work. And the scratch org pull actually retrieves everything that you specify here as the default. So if you have specified this, whatever you're working gets, gets uh, you know, into the folder that you have specified as true. Okay, this should actually get installed. It's just installing, it's gonna take it installed. So it's taking a long time, but definitely it's gonna install actually in the in the environment. All right, so let's open up for questions actually, Amit. Um, yeah, Mohit, I can see there are two questions posted on the chat window. Yeah, let me take them up. So, Okay. Where you first uh, in the Paras Gupta? Paras Gupta, are there any enterprise customers who are able to move from happy soup to unlock packages? Um, so the, the answer to this is, I don't know enough customers actually, uh, but uh, it's certainly a time for us to sort of move from that happy soup way of building applications to this modular approach because you know the benefits it, it just changes your architecture to a whole new level you know um, and provides you that speed and the agility that you need than managing everything in one sandbox and uh, you know sort of doing it i don't know any customers to tell um, but yeah the the you know i can tell you the process to do that conversion uh, you know, if you today, as I said, you can start by, you know, creating unmanaged packages, right? You can go create dependent on, un, un, you know, try to resolve those dependencies, create multiple uh, unmanaged packages. And then once you create those multiple unmanaged packages, you can try converting those unmanaged packages into unlock packages, right? Um, so that's how you can sort of automate it. Um, but yes, I don't know any customers. Let's pick up the second one. We have a supervised org, so we we haven't had a chance yet, but we are hoping they unlock the maximum lookup field for our objects so we can move forward. Um, yeah, I can I cannot answer on that. So, um, yeah, you know, so maximum lookup 
per object, something that you'll have to work with Salesforce. Let's look at the next question. If unlocked packages have a dependencies with a managed package and managed package needs OWD for account to be private, can we update OWD setting while creating unlocked packages? Unlock packages have dependent and a manage. Okay, so they are saying somebody is saying that you know if a manage package needs org wide default for account to be private, right? Can we update the setting while creating unlocked packages, right? Um, so I I don't think this is possible, you know, because unlocked packages. Um, so the the OWD right, it is a part of an object configuration, right? It's a part of the object metadata, correct? So, you know, if you are talking about like scratch orgs, yes, you can you can do it. If you are talking about like overriding in the production, I I don't really know how you know something like this can be done. But what I know is there is a feature called org snapshots, like. Scratch org snapshots where what you can do is you can configure whatever you need that scratch org and all the scratch orgs that you create will be a template of that. You know, so you can set whatever you need there and then create a template. Any recommendation on how to handle profiles as profiles will keep changing with the new packages? So that's good question. How do we handle profiles? So I, I recommend that we move away from the profiles, you know, to permission sets. Um, you know, your your unlock packages should be sort of, um, you know, created into sort of have permission sets handling the permissions rather than like one full profile. So you should also start exploring how you convert your profiles into permission sets so that you can facilitate that. Um, and yeah, sometimes some things will be manual, you know, however, how much of ever you automate on platform. So, all right, any other questions, concerns, um, comments? So, any other thing before we start off? Uh, hey, Moit, this, this is Jagmon. Uh, I posted a question related to unlock package OWD setting. So um, while uploading the package into the scratch org, uh, we need to first install the uh, manage package. And for that, I need to set the OWD setting to private. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then only I was able to install that manage package into scratch org. Mm -hmm. And then I, I was able to push my unlock packages uh, into the scratch -offs. So while creating the version, I was getting the same error message. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how we can configure that part, uh, you know, the OW settings in the, uh, while creating the version of the package. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. There's a feature in Salesforce called as org snapshots. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me show you that feature once again. Or scratch or snapshots. So, yeah, this this feature. Yeah, this is the feature actually. We talk about it's called uh, this snapshot. So we provide you see this we provide scratch or snapshot to selected customers. So this scratch or snapshot is gonna help you. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna create a scratch or where you will you will install your manage package okay and mm -hmm. then what you're going to do is you're going to change the owd setting of that to uh, private okay and then the new scratch org that you're creating you will say you're creating a snapshot from that source scratch org you know you're not creating just a org just a scratch org you're creating a snapshot so that way you you don't have to install that manage package also you know it will already have the package installed and whatever the settings you need, like the OWSP settings or other settings that are still not exposed by the metadata API, all that you can configure there so that your org will be exact replica of that. And then you should be able to easily push the unmanaged package code. Make sense? Mm, okay. Uh, Does that make sense? It. Yeah, yep. th yeah, but that feature you might have to ask Salesforce to enable it. Let's see here. So the CLI should tell us whether that uh, so we can do this real quick here. So you can say SFTA export 
or now let me give you like a snapshot. So you see this SFDX force snapshot create. Mm -hmm. You see this. So this is what um, you will actually leverage once you sort of get it enabled from from Salesforce. So what it will do is it will ask you the source ID. Okay. So the source org ID is this org where you already have configured that managed package and configured your OWD settings. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the new scratch org will already have that managed package and it will already have that OWD setting for you. So you don't have to go and manually do anything there. Okay, got it. Yeah, this makes sense now. Yeah, hopefully it will be able to create the package now. Yes, it will. It will do two things for you. One thing mm -hmm. is, for example, if you have like a very complex managed package application, and let's say after installing that, you are doing some more config on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. Like let's say you have a managed package application like DocuSign or something like uh, Nintex Draw Loop or something like that that has and then you customize on top of it, right? Let's say you went and added some validation rules, workflow rules, et cetera, et cetera. So now that customization, right? You can obviously pull into an unlock package in itself, but you know, let's say that is repeatable for your develop, uh, for your development purposes. So you can have a scratch org, install that package, configure all these things there so that you don't have to reconfigure again and again when you create the new scratch org, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll create a snapshot that will have everything out of it. Okay. 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 Any other questions before we sort of hand over to Amit? Um, so yeah, I'm going to share the slides and obviously Amit is going to share the recordings as well of this. And uh, I understand these topics are very complex, you know, at least complex because it requires, you know, CLI knowledge and sort of understanding of the packages, etc. But I hope this session was um, enlightening and sort of, um, you got something out of it. Thank you so much, Mohit, for a great session.